publisher at the outset to read a story, one with which most of you are certainly already familiar, and one that contains more wisdom about the relation between faith and ethics than I can either devise or incorporate into a brief address. I do not intend to exegete this biblical story, though I shall refer to it several times. Chiefly, I offer it as a kind of parabolic or symbolic representation of everything that I shall try to say in this lecture. This is what I mean. This is the story. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Order your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed by those words and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. It seems to be the fate of religion that it regularly, perhaps inevitably, devolves into morality. We get is the world belongs to God and God wants it back with our help. Or put that in evolutionary terms if you want the biggest picture we know. If we don't stop our violence, then we are another magnificently doomed species. Like the saber-toothed tiger. Magnificent but doomed. The great divine experiment of what if, God speaking, what if that give human beings freedom? What would they do with it? What if you gave a ten-year-old the keys to the car? Would the ten-year-old learn to drive before it killed itself? That's the challenge. You can put it in divine language, you can put it in evolutionary language. They stare at us exactly the same. I don't have any time to even think about the next world. And as Marcus said, quite frankly, I'm not even interested. That's the honest God's truth. I wouldn't argue with anyone about it. If it was a time for narcosis, then you use narcosis. But normal life should not be narcotic. social 
epic. Debt owed by the poor is to be canceled after seven years. Deuteronomy 15, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. No interest is to be charged to neighbors on loans. Deuteronomy 23, practice hospitality to runaway slaves. Deuteronomy 23, no collateral on loans to poor people. Deuteronomy 24, no withholding of wages that are due to the poor. Deuteronomy 24, no injustice to the immigrant or the orphan. Deuteronomy 24, remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. And perhaps most remarkably at the end of chapter 24, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheep in the field, you shall not go back and get it, you shall be left with the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left, it shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather your grapes for your vineyard, do not mean what is left, it shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I am commanding you to do this. Commandment names the three money crops grain, olives, grapes, or elsewhere, grain, oil, olive oil, wine, which are the central produce of a market economy in that part of the world. That triad in this text is juxtaposed to a second triad, widow, orphan, immigrant, the ones who have no power to gain access to valuable commodities, no power to gain access because the economy is defined by the categories of Pharaoh that endlessly constructs a barrier between valuable commodities and needy consumers. But that wall of separation between commodity and consumer is removed by this primal exodus narrative and by the covenant commands that are extrapolated from it. The tradition of Deuteronomy intends to resituate the economy of Israel into the fabric of the neighborhood. In this tradition, it is not true that the economy is a freestanding autonomous system. It is rather checked and measured at every turn by the reality of the neighborhood. This vision of the neighborhood in the book of Deuteronomy continued to refer back to, to the Sinai, but the tradition also recognizes that in deep ways the children of the narrative resist this vision. And so in chapter 15, Moses chides his resistant listeners, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your neighbor. You shall rather open your hand, willingly lend enough to meet the need, whatever it may be, be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking the, year, the seventh year is near, therefore view your neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry out to Yahweh against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and ungrudgingly. Those of you that have Hebrew may know that in that little pericope, there are five absolute infinities. The only place I know in Scripture that has five absolute infinities, which means Moses is really serious. <laughs> propensity to hard-heartedness is countered in the tradition by this memory that this economy with neighborhood, with neighborhood is not just a good liberal or social activist idea, but it is the intention of the God of 